Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk, uh, talk about quadratic functions, which is in section 3.2 of the OpenStax book that we're using. Okay. So the first thing is to define a polynomial, and then we're going to look at, uh, the, look at the general form of a quadratic function, and then the vertex form of a quadratic function. So basically, given a general form of a quadratic quadratic function, I'll show you how to um, take that and express it in vertex form, okay? And then we'll look at the specific properties of a quadratic function, okay? So to start off, um, we're gonna look at the definition of a polynomial function, okay? So, right, here it is, okay? So a polynomial function of degree n is a function of this form that you see here, okay? So a couple of things here. Okay. Um, the a values that you see, okay, those are basically the coefficients, okay? Okay, so these are coefficients in front of the variable. Uh, this, this value right here, okay, uh, without the x, okay, is basically a constant. Okay. Uh, the other important information about this is that uh, the powers that you see, the exponents here, okay? Okay, there's a one here and, right? And so those, those powers uh, must be non-negative, uh, non-negative uh, integers, okay? Powers must be non-negative. Integers. Okay. And the reason why this is, the reason why I use this term here, non-negative, um, is because, so that basically includes the possible, the possibility of having um, a zero power. Okay, so non-negative means all the positive integers, including zero. So for example, right, so this last term out here, we can think of this as a sub zero x to the zero power. Now x to the zero power is just one. So normally, right, normally we don't write like this, okay? So, but it's, un but this is understood to be one, so, okay? All right, so all the powers must be non-negative integers. Okay, so let me show you. Uh, let me just go through some examples here okay, of polynomials. So for example, let's say we have uh, 5x to the power 3 plus, say, 4x power 2 plus x minus 1, okay? All right, so everything looks good here, okay? You have, we have our coefficients, okay? Uh, by the way, the coefficients can be any, basically any real number, okay? And then if you look at the powers here, okay, they're all they're basically uh, non-negative integers, okay? So you have three, two, and then there's a one here, right? And then this one, okay? It's just a constant. Okay, so, so the degree, all right? So because this is written in descending order, meaning that the exponents are going from smallest Right, sorry, from largest to smallest, okay, um, the degree, so basically the degree is uh, going to be this one, okay, assuming, assuming that this is written in descending order, okay, so basically the degree of the polynomial is the largest exponent, okay, so for this polynomial, the degree would be three, okay. Okay, so... All right, so degree is three there. All right. And basically there are, right, four, basically you have four terms here, including this constant. Okay, uh, here's another example of a polynomial. to make this 3x. Okay. 
Okay. So one thing to notice about polynomials is that um, it, you don't have to have all the terms in there, right? So notice that in here, right, in this you don't see um, a power three, right? Uh, there's no power four, okay? So we don't have to, have, it just has to fit this general category, okay? This general um, definition here, okay? Whereas this example here, right, this one is okay, right? So you have three, two, one, and then, um, and then there's, right, for this one, it's degree zero. And because we call that degree zero, so, okay, because we can write like that. So the last term, so this last, what's called monomial, um, the degree of that is zero. So each of these, so another term to, to be mindful of is that each one of these is what's called a monomial, okay? And so when you put together a collection of monomials, you get what's called a polynomial, okay? So looking at our example here, okay, notice that this is not written in descending order, meaning that right, it's jumping from two to six, right, and to, to one and then zero, okay? So the degree here, okay, the degree in this case is gonna be six, right? And it's, you look for the largest exponent, okay? The largest exponent in this, polynomial is going to be six, okay? So that turns out to be the degree, okay? So going back to here, right? So that, going back to this definition, right? Okay, if these are in descending order, right? Then that means this term has the largest exponent. So that's, so this is a polynomial degree n, okay? So another important thing to, so as illustrated here, another thing to keep in mind is that polynomials don't always have to be have to be written in the sitting order. Very important to know that. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me show you some examples of. Uh, let me show you some examples that are not polynomials. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's say we have, okay. and I'm still using P here. Uh, P is our P of X, that's just to represent our function, okay? Um, and again, you don't, we don't always have to use, we don't always have to use P, we can use whatever letter we want, okay? So let's suppose that we have P of X equals to, let's say three X squared, plus x to the one-half power plus one, okay? So this is not a polynomial. Uh, the reason is because the power, right, specifically the power here is not a non-negative integer, okay? So this is, right, this is a rational number. Okay? It's not an integer, okay? So that means this is not a polynomial. It's not an integer value, okay? So by definition, this is not a, this is not a polynomial, okay? Uh, we could have also stated, stated the, we could also state the um, problem this way, right? This is another way to write it. Okay, so square root of x is just the same thing as x to the one half power, so Right, it's the same, same function, but just written differently. Okay, so but the point is that these are not polynomials. Okay, um, here's another example. Okay, I'll call that example one for non-polynomial. Uh, here's another example. Uh, let's say we have four x to the power three plus say x, or let's do this, let's say 3x to the power negative 4 minus 6, okay? So the issue here is that, uh, you notice here the power is negative, okay? So 
that doesn't fit this definition, okay? Remember that these powers, right? These exponents must be non-negative integer. Well, we got a negative integer there, okay? So that's a negative value. It's a negative value. So therefore it's not, right? So this is not a polynomial, okay? The other important thing to keep in mind um, is that polynomials are continuous everywhere, okay? And they, uh, they're also smooth, okay? Which is more of a topic in calculus one, okay? Um, the, like I said, the, and also going back to here with the coefficients, uh, the coefficients can be any number. So, so I can, let's look at a third example of that here. We could have something like this. Okay, so let's say we have five five x cubed plus pi x to the power two minus four x plus ten. So this is still a polynomial. Okay, that's fine. You can have, like I said, the coefficients can be any real number. Pi is a right. Pi is a real number, okay? And the degree of this would, would be three, okay? So, so it doesn't matter, right? If your coefficient is pi or if it's like square root of two or whatever, whatever real number, okay? Uh, the point is that the coefficient, as long as it's a real number, uh, that will work. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to write here what I said earlier. All anomials are continuous everywhere, which means in a sense that you can graph the you can graph the entire function without lifting up your pen or pencil from the paper. Okay? This also tells us uh, that the domain, okay, uh, the domain is always all real numbers. Okay? So the domain, is, so basically, again, this is just saying that the so for any x value you put into a polynomial, um, you will get an output value, okay? So for every input, you get an output, okay? And you can see clearly, right, um, that doesn't happen in this case, okay? You Right, because then you get, if you put a negative number in there, you're getting a square root of minus, okay? So uh, that's one of the issues here. All right, uh, range, range will depend. Um, so the range will depend on the degree, depends on what type of polynomial, uh, depends on the type of polynomial basically. All right, but the domain is always all real numbers, okay? which is a very nice property to have. All right, so let's, uh, so now that we've defined what a polynomial function is, um, we're going to look at quadratic functions. Okay. Okay, so okay, we have all right, so we have what's called constants. If you look at this term, okay, then we have 
I'll just call this Y. Okay, so this is just a constant function. Okay, uh, for example, let's say Y equals to two. Okay, so basically that's just a horizontal line. Okay, and uh, the degree the degree of constants, the degree of something like this is zero. And the reason, the reason for that is because we can rewrite this as, uh, for example, using this, using this specific example here, uh, we can rewrite this as two X to the zero power. So x to the zero power, uh, by definition, is going to be one. Okay, so so that's the degree there, zero. Okay. All right. The next one is uh, it's basically a linear function. Okay. Okay, so you have your you have your slope, and then this is corresponding to the the y value of your y intercept. Okay. Okay, so this is linear. Right? This is also linear. Okay. So, but specifically, this is what we call constant. Linear. So, for example. Let's say we have y equals to 4x plus 3. So the degree of that is going to be 1. Okay, so degree 1. Okay. The largest exponent, right? Okay. I put a one there, but normally again we don't we don't usually do that, but that's just it's understood. Okay. All right. So finally we get to the quadratic form. Okay. okay. All right, so we have degree two. So that's the quadratic form. So degree two. Okay. So for example, let's say we have four x squared plus three x plus one. All right, so you have constant, right? Degree zero, okay. Constants have degree zero. Linear, you have degree one. Quadratic, degree two. And then there's more of these, right? So for example, for what's called a cubic, that's degree three, right? And then so on. And then you get cubic, you get quartic, right? Which is degree four. And then quintic, which is degree five, and so on. So, like I said, we're going to focus on just the quadratics for now. But all of these, right? So, all of these are polynomials. Okay. They're all put together, okay, into this definition here. So, okay. So, you have your constant, right? And then you have this degree one. The next one will be degree two, and so on. Okay. By the way, this, these, these uh, numbers here, okay, these are just index values, if you will, right? So if, right, so we call them index values, so that way we can say, so it's just to distinguish this coefficient from this coefficient. So for example, this could be like a, a sub two, this could be a sub one, okay? 
Okay, so just like I wrote here, okay, a sub two, a sub one, a sub zero. So it's a way to uh, distinguish between those values. Okay, even though it's possible that these values could be, you know, all these values could be equal to each other. Okay, all right. So there's the right. So there's the uh, main three that we've already, well, at least the main two that we've already talked about before. So now we're going to focus on we're going to focus on the quadratics. Okay. All right. So the general form of a quadratic looks like this. So basically the one I have here, except I'm just using, so sometimes we use A, B, and C, but don't let that confuse you. It's just basically nomenclature, okay? So the point is that you have this form. So it has to be, right? So it ha there has to be a degree, there has to be a power two in here, okay? Right, so you can see the largest exponent is two. So, okay, so this is what's called the general form of a quadratic function, okay? From here, um, it can be shown, all right, it can be shown that uh, that you, if you, there's a process here that you can use to, in order to rewrite this in a different way. And we're actually going to, I'm going to go through that um, with a specific example in, later, uh, later on in, in this video. Okay, so, but we can, we can basically rewrite this in what's called vertex form. So the reason they call this vertex form is because uh, we can easily identify uh, the vertex, okay? So basically the vertex um, on a polynomial is where the function, where that function change, where the graph of that function changes direction, okay? So, so the vertex here, okay? Because it's in this specific form, we, we can easily identify the vertex, which is just going to be h comma a. So that's why they call this the vertex form. Okay, and like I said, we're going to look at a very specific example of this, and then we're going to rewrite it in this form. And once we do that, we can easily uh, identify the vertex. Okay. All right. So. Uh, so going through, um, so let's get through, let's go through some of the properties and then we'll start to go through some examples here. Let's do that over here. Okay, properties of quadratic functions. All right, so, so for quadri for the quadratic functions, for the type of quadratic functions that we're looking at, um, it can either, right, the graphs can either do something like this, okay, or something like this. And so this is because we're assuming that uh, we're looking in terms of, we're treating the X as our, ind as our independent variable here. Okay. All right. So the vertex that I mentioned over here, right, that is at this 
point. Like I said, it's where the graph changes direction. Right? You have a vertex here and a vertex here. Okay. All right. Okay, so one of the properties, okay, is that notice that you have either either it's facing up. Or facing down. So this generally we say it's concave up or concave down. Right? So. so if it's so if so when that happens, okay, so that to decide on which case it is will depend on the a value here, the, the value in front of x squared. So if a is positive. Right? If A is positive, that means the function right has to be concave up. Meaning it's facing up like this. Okay? If it's less than zero, means if A is negative, it's going to be concave down. And that's sort of Intuitively, that makes sense because if you have, for example, x squared, okay, so x squared is going to look like this, but as soon as you make the, if you put a negative in front of that x squared, it's going to reflect it over the x axis. So it's going to look something like this, okay? It's going to face downward, okay, or basically a reflection over the x axis. Okay, so positive, so if this is positive, okay, that term, if that term is positive, it's facing up. It's negative facing downward, okay? Um, and this is our vertex, okay? Which is, we're assuming H of K, H comma K. I'm gonna put this over here. All right. Uh, and so with each of these, there's also, an, there's also the axis of symmetry here. Right? Meaning that if you take this part of the curve, you can reflect it over this axis to get this other part. And that uh, and that uh, that axis of symmetry can be described by uh, this equation. Okay, so this is basically because it's a vertical, right? Because it's a vertical line, okay? and I know I put dash marks here, but it's a line, okay? In fact, I'll just go ahead and change it to be a line just to make sure there's no confusion there. So, so the line of symmetry, okay? So it's gonna be X equals to, okay? Whatever, right? So whatever the H value is, okay? Because remember, this vertex occurs at H, K. So since this line, right, is going to go through, right, it's x equals to whatever the x value is here, in this case, h, right? Likewise, okay, same thing here, right? Have our axis of symmetry. And so the, the equation for that will also be x equals to h. Okay, because since we're calling this h of k, and h being your, that's your x value, and that's your y value. Same thing here, your x value and your y value. Okay? Input, output, okay, that idea. All right. So, so every quadratic function has a, has a line of symmetry. Okay. All right, so the domain, okay. Looking at this case first, because remember what I mentioned earlier, these are right, these are polynomials. So polynomials for, for polynomials, the domain is always all real numbers. So no matter what x, you're, no matter what x value you put in, you're going to get output. Okay. 
the range now, right? So the range is basically uh, going to be determined by the vertex. Depends on what, where that vertex is. Okay. So the range, okay, is going to be from, remember, this is K. And remember, the range has to do with the Y values. So here's K, right? And it's going up. So it's going to go from K to infinity. Okay. So it starts here. Remember, it's ranges in terms of Y. So it's going to be from K to infinity. Okay. All right. And our axis of symmetry. is x equals to h. Okay, so let's look at this case. And the domain is going to be all reals. It's a polynomial. Okay? Every polynomial, the domain is all reals. Okay. Uh, the range this time is going to be different here. Because now it's facing downward. Okay? And remember, range, you always go from Right, in terms, if you're looking in the y direction, right, because it's dealing with range, so you're going from bottom to top, just like here, from bottom to top. So we're going to, we're starting from minus infinity and going up to the vertex. Okay, so that means we're going up to this point. So the point, the y value there is k, and we include k in our set. So that's why we, we put a bracket. Same thing here. We put a bracket because we because that point is defined. Okay. And the axis of symmetry, the same. X equals to H. All right. All right. So those are those are the uh, those are some of the properties. And oh, uh, one other thing before I forget. Um, because remember what we talked about earlier, okay, we talked about that the turning, right? Since if you look at this, right? These are your turning points, right? And so remember, um, turning points are associated with your relative min and relative max. So because it's, right? Going, because the Y values are getting smaller here, right? And then they're getting bigger. So there's a relative min here. So the relative minimum is going to be, right, going to be this coordinate, okay? So which is hk. And just remember, the relative minimum is the k value, and h is where it occurs, okay? Okay, so that's where the relative minimum happens. Okay. Over here, it's the opposite because it's going up, right? Their, their y values are increasing and then they're decreasing. So that's going to be a relative maximum. And again, H is where it occurs. Okay. So the H is the, lo the location, and the relative maximum for this case is going to be the K value. That's okay. Remember the, the relative maximum minimum is always the it's always when we're talking about this it's always the output value. Okay. All right. So just by recognizing what the vertex is, we get a lot of information. We get right. We understand. Okay. We can we get the we know the axis of symmetry. We know the range. Uh, and we know the relative minimum. Okay. All right, so let's go through some specific examples here. And I'm just going to write over here the vertex form so that just as a reference. Mm 
Okay, so let's look at an example here. All right, so let's let's say we have our function. We have two x, oh, sorry, that's not even a quadratic, two x, let's say two x squared, okay? So two x squared minus 12 x plus 13. And what we wanna do, okay, is we want to put this in vertex form. Then once we do that, uh, we can figure out what the vertex is. And then we're gonna look at the X and Y intercepts. And then once we have those, we have enough information to where we can uh, we can basically um, graph this, okay? Um, and so we're gonna look at the graph, okay? And then we're also going to, uh, we're gonna find the domain and range. All right, so there's our, right, we have our quadratic, and so we want to put it into this form over here, okay? So to do this, we use a technique called completing the square, okay? And so to, right, so we're going to use this process. There's a process called completing the square. Very important because this is not only used in, in this uh, in pre calculus, but it's also used in, um, in calculus. Uh, it's also used in differential equations. Okay, so it's, um, it's a very, a very important technique. Okay? So, completing, completing the square. All right, so let's go to that. All right, so the first thing is to uh, is to factor out whatever's in front of x squared. So we're going to take the two and separate that from x squared. And then we're also going to factor out two from here. Okay, so that's going to leave us with minus six x. So two times minus six will give us negative 12. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to put a box here. Okay. We're going to put a placeholder, just use it as a box, okay? Because we're going to put something here, okay? And then what about the 13? Well, the 13, okay, I'm going to put out here. But because I'm introducing something here, so what I want to do is in order to keep, in, in order to make sure that we don't change the original problem, I'm going to have, we're going to have minus 2 times whatever we get. Because remember, this box is getting affected by this two here. So it's two times whatever we get here. Okay, and there's a minus. So we're basically adding in what's called a hidden zero. Okay, and then the 13 is going to be out here somewhere. So, all right, so this is really the, still the same thing as this, but just written in a different form. Okay, so the question is, how do we, how do we get this value? Well, that's, that's the part of the completing the squares process. So the way to the process to get this is you basically take half of the, whatever values in front of x, okay? 
And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if the doesn't matter whether you have a, a negative six or positive six, because what you're going to eventually do is square this. Okay, so we take half of the number in front of x and then square it. And then that's going to give us so nine, right? So we get minus six over two, so it's negative three, negative three squared is nine. Okay. okay. So now let's rewrite this. Okay, so we have two times x squared minus 6x plus 9 minus 2 times 9 plus 13. Okay. All right. So look at this. Okay, we have so this would be okay. Um, that turns out to be factorable, okay? So we're going to get x, okay? So, okay? so this is just going to be x, and then we have minus 3 here, and another minus 3, right? Because we get x squared here, minus 3x, minus 3x gives us negative 6x, negative 3 times negative 3 is going to be positive 9. And then out here, this part right here, that's minus 18 plus 13, Okay, uh, that's going to give us negative five. Okay. All right, so this can be written as x minus three to the power two, and then we got the five, the minus five there. So it, we don't necessarily have to show this part. You can, we can immediately jump from here to here. Okay, so all you do is because of this step. It works out, okay, it works out that this is always going to be factorable. So we can put x, okay, x squared, we need an x, and then square root of 9 is going to be 3. And then the minus, right, the minus is going to go there. Okay. Right? Okay. So that is completing the square, okay? Uh, all right. And so we have our, we have our solution here. Okay, so let's go over here. So we can right with this form, right? We can easily identify what the vertex is. The vertex turns out to be three comma negative five. All right. Okay, so have this. Okay, so function now looks like this: two times x minus three squared minus five. Okay. All right. So we have our okay, we have our vertex. Okay. So remember, this is your h. That's your k. There's our vertex. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have right. So we have our solution. Okay. We have the right. We express this function in vertex form. We have our vertex. The next thing to do is to um, go through and find the x and y intercepts. Okay. So let's first find the y intercept. So remember, the y-intercept is where the graph is going to cross, right, the y-axis, okay? So it's going to take on the form of zero some number, okay? Okay, so, right, so in order to get this number, okay, that means we're going to take, we want to let x be zero, okay? We let x be equal to zero, then solve for y. Okay. So we can either use this form or that form. Okay, it doesn't matter. Let's go and use this form. So we're going to basically evaluate, right? So let x be zero. So that's just basically evaluating the function at zero. 
So we're going to get two times zero minus three squared minus five. Okay. So that's going to give us two times three squared minus five. So we're going to get nine okay, times two, which is 18. Okay. And then 18 minus five. Uh, so what is that going to give us? Basically, uh, could give us uh, 13. So you get right. So you get 18 minus 5, which is, yeah, which is 13. So that means our y-intercept is this. So 0, comma 13. Okay. Again, so that is what this tells us is where the graph of this function is going to intersect the y-axis. Okay. All right. So something probably you've worked, so something to observe here, which I think probably some of you have noticed is that if you look over here, back to our original function, notice that when you put in zero here, right, you're gonna get 13. So when the when the when our function, right, if your function, if your quadratic is written this form, the constant turns out to be the y-intercept. Okay. So we really didn't need to do all this. We can just say, okay, we can look here and we can see that the y-intercept will be zero, comma, whatever this number this whether this number is in that case, uh, in this case, 13. And so that sort of makes sense because when you evaluate the function at zero, these terms you know, become zero. And so that leaves you with this number, okay? So, all right. And by the way, so this is the general process, anyway, so this is the general process for, for, y, for finding the y-intercept for any function, not just, not just quadratic, okay? This is, the general, this is the general way to do it, okay? regardless of whatever type of function it is. Okay, um, let's look for the x-intercept now. Which is usually a little bit more involved. So that means we want to, we want to let y be zero and then figure out what this number is, okay? All right, so to do that, we need to, right, we want to basically set, in this case, set the equation equal to zero, okay? So this, so this being y, right, so you're going to set, you're going to have this equal to zero. And because we have this vertex form, we can use this one, okay? And then we can solve for x. Okay, so we're going to take this. We set that equal to zero because right, we got to figure out okay what x makes the zero. So in other words, we got to find the input that makes that gives us a, an output of zero. Okay, so we solve this equation. So using algebra, okay. So we first move over the five. Okay. okay. And so the, the goal is to isolate the x, right? So we need to divide both sides by two. So we get x minus three squared equals to five halves, okay? All right, and then let's see, let's, uh, what we do from here now is we can take the square root of both sides. When you do this, don't forget the plus or minus here. Okay, and then, so the square root is going to undo this square. So we end up getting x minus 3 okay, equals to plus or minus square root of 5 halves. Okay. So again, we set the function equal to 0. Uh, we isolate the x minus 3 squared part. So we move over 5, divide both sides by 2. Okay. And then we have this. So to undo the square, take the square root of both sides. And now all we have to do here is 
basically just add three to both sides. Okay. And so let me write that a little bit bigger here. All right. So we get basically this is the x, right? So we get two values of x, okay, plus or minus, right? Okay. So the x intercepts, okay, the x intercept will be this. Let's put that over here. So in one case, we're going to get three plus root five over two, comma zero. The other case, the other one is going to be three minus root five over two, comma zero. Now the thing is, we can also uh, sometimes uh, we can rewrite this in a different way by rationalizing. Let's go using right by rationalizing our um, our square root. So. Uh, so let me just go and let me just do that side here. So square root five over two, that is the same thing as root five over root two. Okay. And then we can write in order to write this without putting the square root in the denominator, we can multiply the top and bottom by root two. So that's going to give us okay, so square root five times square two, that's the same thing as root 10 over so root two times root two is just two. Okay. So another way to write this, another way to express the solution is to write this way. So three plus root 10 over two comma zero, or, and then we also have this one, three minus root 10 over two comma zero. So it's important to know, right? It's important to recognize that these are the same, okay? So, right? So basically that tells us where this graph is going to intersect the x-axis, okay? All right. All right, so, okay. And so the domain, okay, let's find the domain and range. Okay. The domain of this function okay, is going to be all reals. Remember, polynomials, the domain is always all reals. And how about the range? Well, going back to the vertex, okay, the range, okay, uh, and this is, right, this is a positive value. So this, the graph of this is going to look something like this. It's going to be facing upward. So, right, so this is where your, right, this is where your vertex is. So based on that, based on that, uh, based on what we see here, okay, the range is going to be from, okay, from minus five to infinity. Okay, you're starting at, right? So the Y value for the, right? So the Y value is in other words, this point right, is three minus negative five. So the Y value, right? So it's negative five going up. Okay, so from minus five to infinity. Okay. All right. So let me. So if we put all the pieces together, okay, this is what the graph is going to look like. So I'm going to share that here. All right. So okay. So if you see this, okay. So here are the roots that we found. Uh, and what you see here, these are just the, so basically these are the approximations. And you see the vertex we got was three comma negative five, okay? And so, and, and your y-intercept, by the way, is up here. Just plot that. It was at zero comma 13. Up there, okay? So we have enough points, right? So we, 
basically draw a curve through those points. And if you want, I can plot the this line of symmetry, which is going to be x equals to three. Let me see. I'll put that in a different color. All right, so there is that's what the graph of this parabola looks like. So again, we have our roots. Vertex was three comma negative five. Positive two, facing upward. And there's our, there's our y-intercept. Okay. So like I said, we can get a lot of information just by taking this polynomial and writing it in um, in the vertex form. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's do another example just to make sure. Uh, so this example is going to, we're going to use complete the square because like I said, it's a very important technique. And then we're going to, we can, um, and then for this example, we're going to um, locate, um, we want to basically figure out um, where they basically figure out what is the maximum value? Where does it occur? All right, so let's say we want to find maximum value of this function. So first of all, how do we how do we even know that this is going to have a maximum value? Well, we know this is negative, right? So that means the curve, right, in general, it's going to do something like this. So that's where you have the relative max, okay? So now we just, uh, so we can use complete the square to put this into vertex form. So let's do that, okay? So again, we got to we take out the whatever the coefficient here is, in this case, minus. And then, because that's positive, okay, I need a negative here because negative times negative is positive, okay? And then we're going to put something here. Okay. And because it's effect, this is affected by the minus sign, I need to put a plus here so that you want the opposite values, okay? And then, so this is going to be plus something and then plus two from here. Okay, so we're add, so in this case, right, we're subtracting something, but we have to add something to keep. So it's basically just rewriting this without changing the original form, okay? Or about, sorry, without changing the original function. Okay, all right, so the way we get this value, okay, remember is that you take half of whatever's in front of X, in this case, negative one. And then we square it. So that's gonna give us one fourth. Okay, that means okay, we're going to get minus 
x squared minus x plus one fourth. And so right here, this is gonna be one fourth plus two. Okay, so now remember, because of this step, this is going to give us, okay, we need an x there, okay? And then you take the square root of this term. So square root of one fourth is one half. So it's gonna be minus one half here and to the power two. So you can check your work, right? You can say x minus one half times x minus one half, and it should give you, should give us this, which it does, okay? And then this one, okay, one fourth plus two, okay? Um, if you want, and work that out in detail. This is just one four plus we need a we need a four in the bottom here. So that means we're gonna get eight over four. Okay, so one fourth plus two is gonna give us nine fourths. Okay. So there it is, right? Okay, there's our uh, function written in right and um, in vertex form. Okay, so the vertex here, the vertex is going to be one half, right? Okay, you have the minus there, okay, so this is going to be one half, comma, my force. All right, and and that gives us our answer, okay? We know that the maximum value occurs at one half and the actual maximum value is nine fourths. So that's where it occurs. The actual value, the actual maximum value is going to be uh, Nine fourths. Okay. So always keep that in mind that will be whether it's maximum or like so, okay, maximum or minimum. All right. When you're referring to those, it's always the the y value. And something else to keep in mind here, notice I didn't use the term relative because the way the shape is, the way, because of the graph, okay, yes, this this is can also be considered to be a relative max. But if you look, um, technically speaking, this is the largest y value for the whole graph, right, over the whole real line, okay? So that's why we can just say this sometimes referred to as the absolute max. Same thing if you have a, Parallel facing up, that will give us an absolute min. Okay. So it's kind of a, a special case for quadratic functions. Okay. But the point is that we have, right, we found the absolute max for this. Um, we found the maximum value. Okay. Okay. Um, so there is a uh, there is an alternate method for finding the uh, for finding the finding the max or minimum. So let me talk about that. Okay, so given, okay, so basically basically given this form, okay, so if we have ax squared plus bx plus c, okay, so there's a, uh, there's a formula, okay, um, that will basically give us our vertex. Without having to go through this process, but I still emphasize. I still want to mention that the completing the square is a very, very important technique. Okay, 
All right, so the vertex is, so again, assuming this form can be shown okay, that the vertex is going to be negative B over 2A. So that's the X value, right? And, and then the Y value is just plugging in this value into the function. So once you have this, once you have the X value, then you just plug that number back into the function and that gives you your output value. And so that gives you your vertex. Okay. All right, so let's uh, let me illustrate this idea. And let's say we have for the first case, let's say we have x squared plus 4x. So in this case, uh, this is going to, because this positive, okay, it's going to have a minimum. Okay. It's facing upward because this is positive right in front of this, in front of the leading coefficient, which is. When I say leading coefficient, we're going to get more into, we're going to discuss that in another section. But leading coefficient means um, basically if it's written, written in descending order, which is what this, which is what we have here. So this is what's called a leading coefficient. Okay? So the sign is positive. So it means it's facing up. Okay? So that means this is going to, there's going to be a relative or minimum. Okay. So let's apply that. Uh, let's apply this formula here. So we have that A, right? Okay, so A is a, so A is the value in front of x squared, B is the value in front of x, and C is your constant value. Okay, so A is one, B is four. So always all we have to do is plug it into there. So x, the x value for the vertex is going to be negative b over two times a, which is one. So we're going to get negative four over two. So the value is going to be negative two. Okay, so how do we get the y value? Well, we got the input, we just plug it back into the function. Okay, so we're going to get negative two squared, which is four minus eight, that gives us negative four. Okay. So therefore, Okay. Our vertex is going to be negative two, negative four. Uh, and so that basically tells us now, okay, so right, so our our minimum in this case is going to be this value, okay. which occurs at x equals two minus two, okay? All right, so we found our minimum and we know where it, where it, where it happens, okay? Okay, uh, let's do another one. So, same example, but for a different function. 
So let's say we have uh, negative 2x squared. So it's 4x, negative 5. So again, going back to our definition, We just need to apply this, okay? So we have A is negative two, B is four, B is gonna be negative five. Uh, and we really don't need C here, okay? Just a take. All right. Okay, so we plug everything in, okay? So X is going to be equal to, right? Okay, so x is going to be negative b by, by 2 times a. We get negative 4 over minus 4. That's going to give us 1. All right. And then for the y value, okay, so y, right, so it's going to be f of, or in this case, g of 1. So we'll find the output for this value. We're going to get negative 2 times 1 squared plus 4 times 1 minus 5. So that's going to give us negative 2 right, plus 4, which is 2, and then 2 minus 5 is negative 3. So therefore, our vertex is one comma negative three, okay? And because this is negative, right, in front of the x squared, it's a negative value. So the function, right, looks like it's gonna be facing downward. Okay. So that's where our vertex is, okay? So that means in this case, because it's facing downward, that's the vertex is where, um, is where the relative, uh, this, sorry, where the maximum, all right, so maximum is, again, it's the y value, so negative three, just like over here, minimum in this case was negative four. So maximum is gonna be negative three. And that occurs at x equals to one. Okay. All right. All right, so the last example is basically looking for, an, basically we have to write an equation for a quadratic function given, uh, given its graph. So let's go to that. Okay, so let's suppose that we want to write an equation. And for the quadratic function, we're going to call that G. Okay, so write the equation, write an equation for the quadratic function. And let's assume that we want to, uh, so we want to put it uh, in vert, we want to write in vertex form and in uh, general form.
So okay, let's say we are given, right? So we are given the graph for this function. There's the x, right? There's our x-axis, our y-axis, right? Remember, this is your independent axis, your dependent axis. And um, our, our parabola, okay, it's going to look like this. All right, so I'm going to do something like this, and it's going to go through this point, something like this, okay? So it's not hard to reach all this. Let's say like this way. It's something like that. Okay. That's the best I can do. All right. So, and the important part is that this is going through on this graph. Okay. It's there's a there's the y intercept there. Okay. So I'll just indicate that here. Okay. So we have a y intercept at zero, negative one. And this point down here, okay, this is where on that graph, this is where the graph is changing direction. Okay. So this means this is our vertex here. Okay. That happens to be at negative two comma negative three. All right, so right, we get the gen we get the general idea. Okay, we have the vertex and we have the y-intercept. So my, the point is that we have enough information from this uh, to actually write out the equation. Okay. All right, so we start with right. So because we're given the vertex, uh, we use the vertex form. Right? Okay, so we have g of x equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. So vertex form, right? We just need to plug it into there. Okay, remember, so this is h acting as h, and this is acting as k, right? So we plug it back into here, okay? So we have g of x equals to a times, right, x minus negative two, right? So because h is negative here, so it's x minus negative two, plus in this case, well, k is negative three, so this is gonna be minus three, okay? So let's simplify this. So that's what we have so far. So now the question is, how do we figure out, how do we find a? Well, to get A, okay, we need a point on the graph, another point, okay? We don't want to use the vertex because if we use, right, if we plug in negative two here, we're going to get zero. And that's just going to give us, right, that's not going to, that's basically, that gives us, that's going to give us all zero here. So it's going to wipe out the term that contains A, so we don't want that. 
However, we do know, right? We do know the y-intercept. So we can use that to figure out what A is, okay? Okay, so we use another, we use a different point on the graph, okay? Something besides the vertex. Okay, so, right, so this is what we have, okay? So we have, we know that, right? So G of zero, okay? We know that when X is zero, Y, right? Your output is gonna be negative one. Okay, and so we have A times zero plus two squared minus three. So you, you let x be zero, and we know g of zero is negative one. So now, what we have to do is solve for this. So that's gonna give us, okay. so I'll put, oh, I'll write it this way first. So we have minus one equals two. So we get two squared, this is four. So we get four times eight minus three. Okay, now uh, we just need to solve for A. So I'm gonna put my variable, just, I'm just used to putting the variable expression on the left-hand side. So I'll just switch it around, it's okay. And then, right, we're gonna add three to both sides. So that's actually not four, that's gonna give us, so negative one plus three, that's going to give us 4a equals to 2, okay? Now solve for a by dividing both sides by 4. So it's going to be 2 over 4, which is 1 half. So there's our a value, okay? So we have, okay, so our function looks like this. We have 1 half, okay? We have 1 half times x plus two squared minus three. Okay, there it is, okay. That's our, uh, that's our function, okay. Right. And vertex one, okay. So now, how do we get the general form, okay? So we found the vertex form, okay. There. Now we need to figure out the general form. Well, to do that, pretty, pretty straightforward, just multiply everything out, okay? This is just x plus two times x plus two minus three. So expand it, expand everything out, okay? And so this is gonna give us x squared, Plus, we get 2x plus another 2x. That gives us 4x. And then we have 2 times 2, which is 4. Right? And then minus 3. And then we distribute the 1 half. So we get 1 half times x squared. 1 half x squared. 1 half times 4 is 2. So we get 2x. 1 half times 4 is 2. Minus 3. And therefore we get right, one half x squared okay, plus two x and then two minus three is one. Okay. And there's our right, there's our general form. That's the general form of a, a quadratic function. Okay. All right. So again. We're given this graph, okay? You identify the important components, which is, right, which we can read from here as the vertex, y-intercept. We plug the h and k into here, and then you use another point. It could be a root, it could be, I'm sorry, it could be a, um, yeah, it could be possibly if they give you the root, you could use that, right? In this case, we weren't given that, so we, but we were given that this crosses, this graph crosses at the y-axis. So we were given that. We can use that to figure out what A is, okay? And so right, we know the relationship between zero and negative one. So G of zero is minus one. 
and then you plug zero into here, and then and then solve this for a. All right. The other so I I forgot to mention this earlier, but the important the other important um, the other important part of this or why this vertex form is important is because you can use you can use this form to right you can use this form to basically plot the function also. I mean using through the use of transformations, right? So we know that the basis function for this basis function meaning the parent function, right? Parent function is x squared. So you have, right? So we have a horizontal shifting here, okay? So it's going to shift to the left two units because it's plus two, okay? So it's going to shift to the left two units. And then it's going to be one half, right? So that means that's a value between zero and one. So it's, right? Okay. So it's going to be a, uh, it's going to affect it in the vertical sense. So it's going to be a, a vertical compression, okay? And then it's going to shift down by three units. All right. So that's another benefit of 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 writing of have of writing the uh, parabola in vertex form is because then you can you, you can use transformations uh, to to basically uh, plot the plot the graph of, or to to graph the to graph that function. Okay. All right. Um, so that basically includes everything. Okay. All right. And so um, I'll go ahead and stop here. Right? And then next time we're going to focus more on just polynomials in general. Okay, so looking at polynomials not only of degree two, but uh, more generally speaking, degree three, degree four, 